I'm now going to introduce Kyle. And you know, there's not much I can say about Kyle that you guys have not already witnessed. But after he made fun of me and my accent, and made it seem like I sound German and have bad grammar, I figured I'm just going to play that part as I introduce him. So this is how his introduction video is going to be like, OK? So this is vision according to Kyle C's. All right, everybody. Now we're going to have Mr. Kyle, yes? Very, very funny man. He come up here. He, I, I like him. I like him a lot because he, um, he make funny, funny joking. And then he, um, he, he also very inspiring. He make your brain grow. And he use many naughty words. Fucking this, fucking that. Very funny. OK, so Kyle, Kyle, come, come, brother, come. Oh, folks, keep it going for a poo, ladies and gentlemen. It was awesome. That's not the voice I gave you. It was, it, was much, it was more like, oh, so good. So good comedian coming up. Um, it's an absolute honor to be at this event. Um, I want to thank Vision and everyone again for having me. And, and um, I hope you enjoyed what I did last night, if you guys got to see it. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, it's funny because after that, uh, a lot of people came up to me, and then today people came up to me and said, that was amazing how you did that, how you were just off the cuff and you were saying stuff that you were just thinking about and, and that you just saw and, and that it was, it was really quick. And I uh, have been going through this theory that actually that's actually easier um, than the way that we're choosing to live our lives. In other words, like, I just go with the moment. Like, those guys stood up and ran, so I saw that and commented on it. And, and that's all I'm thinking. And in our lives, that's all we have to do is just say what we're actually thinking. And it frees you of it, you know? If you go to your friend's house, you don't have a set list. You don't sit there and go, first I'll ask him if he has pets, and then if he likes ice cream. I'll ask that first, because that puts you in memory. You go into his house in both past and future. You know, you literally go in there going, I gotta remember to say this. So you leave the moment completely and you go, I gotta remember that. And if you were talking to your friend and like the earth shook, you'd comment on it, right? You wouldn't sit there and try to keep him focused. No, not, don't notice that, just listen to what I'm saying. You'd be in that. It's actually more effortless, and it's funny because I'm a stand-up comic, and there's a hundred thousand. There's literally like 108,000 people trying to do comedy, and 99% of them are 100%. They're just completely. They think that they are their material. You know, they think that they are their jokes. You're not your jokes. You're not your product even. It's you. People don't go to see Ellen DeGeneres' jokes. They go to see Ellen DeGeneres and her take on things and how she feels about things. And, and so that's what you're really selling here with what you're doing. And the bizarre thing is it's so effortless. It's so freaking effortless that our minds can't handle it. And it, when you say, let go, people go, how do I? And, and well, there's no process. You're adding more process to it. You, you just allow. And, well, how do I allow? Like, there's a time that you should start allowing. Like, well, at Wednesday, you, 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 like, we don't need any linear time. It literally is just this moment. And I, the first thing I do is I go, every single moment is equally important. This moment right now, when I'm talking to one of you, when I'm peeing, if I'm on Conan O'Brien, all moments are equally important. The problem is we put so much emphasis on a future moment that we burn out the current moment that we're in. And a lot of times we just spend it worrying and creating situations on how that moment could be bad. You know what I'm saying? So we'll be like a, like a very, a, I know a million comics and they are, they're, they're bred out of skepticism. So like they come up with brilliant sabotaging ways to do things. So like if you hear that you got Comedy Central in a week, the first thing the comic will do, and most of us will do, is, is come up with, oh God, I have this thing that's more important than this moment. And you completely lose appreciation for this moment. And you come up with this future moment and you come up with why uh, it's going to, it's so, first of all, you come up with why it's so important, meaning like, you're in lack if you, this doesn't go well. You're saying to the, when you are worried about how something goes, you're saying to the universe, I'm in lack if this doesn't go right. Does that make sense? You're literally saying, this has to go well because this completes me. This is the most important thing. Versus just being okay with what is and just trusting. 
And, and it's just a matter of trusting. It 100% is. It's just a matter of allowing and just not getting in the way of anything. And I'll tell you that my story is that I started doing comedy when I was 12 years old. I actually started in second grade. My teacher told me during class that if I would just shut up, she'd give me five minutes at the end of the week to do whatever I wanted. And, <laughs> And at the time, my uncle worked for Gallagher, the famous comedian Gallagher. He made all of his props. And so every year for Christmas, we'd get like Gallagher videos and all this stuff. And it was funny because I'd watch all these Gallagher videos and, and this guy had toys and all this stuff. And so I started in second grade doing stand-up for the second graders. I'd do Gallagher's material, which was funny because he was talking about sex and taxes with a southern accent. And I didn't even get what I was saying. I would look, like, I'd talk to the school and be like, women, you go out shopping, you buy us underwear that fits cardboard. Am I right, guys? And like, I'd pull up my dad's underwear with cardboard. It was like ridiculous. And every year I would just renegotiate with the teachers in third grade. I'd be like, I'm going to be really good at the end of the week. Can I do stand-up? And then uh, when I was 12, this is true, I, I, I just said I want to do comedy clubs. And so my favorite show when I was growing up was Evening at the Improv. I didn't care about He-Man or any of that shit. Like, I was just Evening at the Improv and, like, comedy specials. And when I was 12, my dad took me to my first comedy club, and I did a set and was oblivious to the idea that it wouldn't work out, and I killed it. And then they said, do you want to work here more? And then I just started doing stand-up every, uh, every weekend at these comedy clubs. And then at 15, I remember asking this question, how can I make more money? I was making probably four or five hundred a week as a feature act at 15 years old, opening for people like Gilbert Gottfried and those kind of people, and I would just be like, how do I make more money? And it's so funny how different that question is when we're kids than, than when we ask now, like, why me? And, you know, why has this happened to me? And all these things that we ask. And as Tony Robbins once said, he said, when you ask why me, you'll get, because you suck, because you always do this, you know, because you always date the wrong person. So I was just like, how do I make more money? And I remember asking a comedian, how do comics make good money? And the guy said, well, corporate parties. He goes, companies have parties, you know, and they charge, or they pay good money for good comedians. And he said, but you're probably too young. I didn't hear the last part. I was just like, next question. Oh, how do I do corporate parties? Like, there's a given, there's a way to do it. So I asked my mom, Bambi. Um, her name's not Bambi, we just call her that because she's a stripper and her mom was killed by a hunter. But so, <laughs> I said to her, I was like, where do com companies meet up? <laughs> I said, where do companies meet up? And she told me about the Chamber of Commerce. And so I was just like, oh, at 15, I was like, oh, okay, I'll just call the Chamber of Commerce. And I just, at 15, it's just an effortless flow. I was like, can I get the mailing labels to the businesses? You know, like, yeah, it's 35 bucks or whatever. And I was like, cool. And then I made a flyer. It said, having a corporate party looking for entertainment, call Kyle Cease. And I sent it out to 500 businesses. And at 15, I was doing corporate parties for Sears, Nintendo, Microsoft, all these companies, right? And it was just the most effortless thing. And I, I found the more I charged, the more I got work, the more they said yes. And I was making a lot of money because I wasn't going the standard route that you think that you have to take. Like when we go, the economy's bad. Well, you're morons if you think that's a real thing, you know? Like if you think that you're going, oh, well, that means I can't get a job and go work as a slave for someone. Or you go, that's an opportunity to create anything because we have the internet and you can do anything with the internet. So I was just like, oh, okay. So well, how do I keep doing this? And so that was going on. And then at 18, they made a new rule that comics couldn't go into comedy clubs unless you were 21. I, was, I didn't even know that that was a problem. I was just like, okay, well, I'll rent out high school theaters. And, and I started renting out high school theaters and I was making like 10,000 a night at like 17, 18, producing my own shows. And the comics, comedy clubs were paying nothing compared to that. And so at 19, there was a casting director that was teaching an acting workshop, and all my friends were saying to me, you know, don't go take an acting class. You're either an actor or you're not, you know? And I was like, yeah, but I might meet some people or whatever. So I was kind of funny in the class, and then uh, two weeks later, that casting director ended up being the casting director for the teen movie, 10 Things I Hate About You. And so she called me in for this part, and I was just at, still at an age where I was oblivious to the idea that I couldn't do this. I completely was just, okay, cool. I didn't have a headshot or a resume or all the things that you think that you need to have to make something happen. I just went into the audition and was just this cheesy guy and brought in this character. I was like, <laughs> you know, and did this thing. And every time I s said their line, I just ended with, that must be Nigel with the brief. <laughs> and I did this line. and. And the, the director was like, brilliant, I've, ne I've never seen that. I mean, like, they just couldn't believe it. And, 
And there were, there were like 500 other people with resumes and agents and all those things that you would think that you need going for it. But I was so oblivious to the idea that I needed that, that I just ended up two weeks later not only finding out that I booked the part, but they rewrote the role because they liked what I did so much that they ended up, I had a two week part, they ended up shooting, I ended up shooting for six and a half weeks. So then, I was like, holy crap. So I did, I, but, I, but here was the thing. I actually wasn't like, holy crap. Everyone around me was. Like, this is just how it works. It's fun to me how much we have to hear, you know, there's consciousness and there's a spirit out there you can connect to. If you really know that, you'll just be there. You don't have to sit there. And you don't need, you're not reminded all day that you have an arm. Like, it's just part of you. You know, you don't sit there and wonder if you have an arm. You know what I'm saying? Like... You don't do that. You just are in flow. But we're sitting here spending all day trying to figure out if we're a part of this thing, you know, and so that's what's getting in the way of us, you know. So I moved to L.A., and uh, every one of my comic friends were like, don't move to L.A., you're going to be back here. And then they started listing all the people that failed in L.A. and said, this guy didn't make it, and this guy, you're going to be back here. And, you know, because they had proof that I won't make it because they told me about other people who didn't know what we know. And so... <laughs> I moved to L.A., and I, two weeks into living in L.A., I bumped into a guy that I shot 10 Things I Hate About You with, and he had a friend that did the movie, or that was shooting the movie at the time, not another teen movie, which is a big teen spoof movie. And I just said to him, oh, could you uh, get me, ask him if I could get in the movie? Like, <laughs> you know, just, and he was like, what? And I go, yeah, ask him. Like, tell him, I did 10 Things I Hate About You. They're doing a movie that's spoofing teen movies. I said, tell him, I'm in the movie. Like, let me... And so he goes, okay. So he told him, two days later, I get a call. They go, they want to see you on set for not another teen movie. All I had to do was ask. And we all know this, but it's just a reminder. If you ask, you'll get yes or no, and you'll be no worse off than if you didn't ask at all, right? In fact, you'll be better because you know the answer. So it's just like, which and one time my friend who's kind of skeptical goes, well, if that's the case, wouldn't I just ask out every hot girl ever? Sure. Why the fuck wouldn't you? Like, ask, <laughs> like, yes. Like, until you're happy, yes, do it until you have what you want. Like, you're right, never mind, settle. So, like, it's fascinating to me how many people come up with why it won't work, and they just want to be right over happy. And so, I get not another, I, I go in, oh, I shouldn't spoil it for you, but I'll get it. Um, but I go into not another teen movie, and they're shooting the movie, and he goes, show me you doing the slow clap. The part was for a character called the slow clapper, which is a guy that always shows up in the, you know in every movie there's a guy that's slowly clapping, and, and he's getting everyone else to clap. Well, my guy tries to show up in the movie, but it's always an inappropriate time. So, like, the girl's in a fight with another person or someone died, and my guy stands up, and it's just totally awkward, and that was the part, and I thought it was so funny. And so I go into the audition, and they're shooting Not Another Teen Movie, and he goes, okay, show me you doing the slow clap. And I did this, and he goes, hold on a second. And he turns away, and he shoots Not Another Teen Movie for 45 minutes and forgot about me, and I'm standing behind him like, do I have another movie? Like, and so he turns and looks at me, he goes, oh, yeah. And he looks at the writer and goes, what would you think? And the writer goes, oh, I love him. And he goes, all right, you're the slow clapper. Like, I didn't have an agent, and I did, I, did one, I did one clap. That was it. I'm glad I didn't miss. Oh, shit. Like, usually these hit. So, so now I have two movies, two major, huge, hit teen movies under my belt with no headshot, no resume, nothing. Which means it's not a fluke that I got the first one. The first one, you go, well, that might have happened. It was just a weird, lucky thing. That's not how life works. Well, I got two. I got two. And there's people I know that doubt everything but have all those other resources that you think you need and didn't book things for 10 years, you know? It's not the things that you need. It's not the, I need the right agent. I need the right... It's, it's all bullshit. And so... So I booked this movie, and then because of that, I was like, well, how can I capitalize on this? Well, colleges, you know, college kids, uh, that would be huge, you know. So I ended up doing, in my 20s, over 700 colleges. I've done the most colleges of any comedian ever, actually. And um, I ended up in 2004 doing 68 colleges in a row. Every single day, literally, I was on a, a two to three flights away. Because these colleges, for some reason, are in the middle of nowhere, right? They tell these kids, don't drink and don't do drugs and don't have sex. And they make it so they fucking have to. It's like you're, <laughs> their choices are Walmart or Susie. And it's like, hmm, you know, both are always open. So, like, I... 
so I'm doing, I'm doing this college tour, and it's absolutely insane. I do 68 colleges in a row. I'm living on the road, partying. I'm not eating anything but drive through I'm drinking. I'm having a great time. But at the end of the tour, I had no sleep. And literally, I'm just also panicking, trying to get to the next flight each day. At the end of the tour, I ended up on the road getting hospitalized with pneumonia. I, was, I almost died. I was in Vegas, and I... And I went through this whole thing where I was, I was stuck and, and my body had this blood barely moving through me. And then in 2005, I was on stage one day and I thought to myself a sabotaging thought. Because what happens in our life when we get to a plane, if we don't keep going, you get comfortable. And when you get comfortable, you, if you're not creating constantly, your mind will creatively sabotage. If you aren't creating constantly, your mind will constantly creatively sabotage. It will come up with really brilliant ways to fuck you up because you're not using it. It's just like not going to the gym, right? But if I had a comedy act that was down pat, I had no reason to grow, right? Because I'm pulling off standing ovations, I'm doing the show, so I could do the show word for word every night and I could do it in my sleep, which meant my mind had time to roam while I was on stage. So it started thinking sabotaging thoughts. And one day on stage, I'll never forget this, I remember this gig so vividly, I thought to myself, I wonder if you think about it enough, if you could make yourself faint. That was the thought I had. And everyone who's ever had an anxiety or fear knows that it stems from a really weird thought. Like, it doesn't make any sense to everyone else. You'll be like, I just have this thing where I'm worried a penis will float in the room and sit on my head, and I'll be named Dr. Penis Head for four months. And I know it doesn't make any sense, but, but it's real to you, right? So right when I thought, I wonder if you think about it enough, if you could make yourself faint, I looked at my hand, and I started whiting out. So now I had proof that it could happen, right? So now you have a belief, and you have proof that it works, right? So I was like, oh my god, I could. And I was doing that on the stage. And so I was linking that fear to the stage, right? Because we link things together. If you hear a song and it reminds you of an ex and jolts your nervous system, it's not the song's notes that are doing that. It's you had an emotional connection and then a song kicked in. And so now you think of that song or you hear that song and you think of her. It's Pavlov's dog, right? So I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if you think about it enough if you can make yourself faint while I'm standing on stage. So then I walked off stage and asked other comics. I was like, I have this thing where I'm worried I'm going to faint on stage. I'm off the stage and I'm fine and I'm pointing at the stage like that's the bad place. And the comics go, and comics are dicks. They're like, oh, you totally could. You, you, you could totally, you know. And then they started giving me proof. One time Dave Chappelle fainted on stage and one guy goes, you know, in the army they can freeze their hearts down to one beat a minute to make the enemy think they're dead. I'm like, shut up. Like, <laughs> you're killing me. And then... I would say to the girl I was dating, like, I have this thing where I'm worried I would faint. And then she starts giving me love for that. She's like, baby, you're not going to faint. So now I'm associating love to worrying, and that's what we do, right? You're depressed. Everyone loves you, right? You, everyone will give you connection. But if you become successful, you're a, you're a threat to them because they are reminded that they weren't. So it becomes lonely in your mind because you don't realize that there's this group and people at the top that are waiting for you and you'll have a whole new set of friends, you know? But people don't realize that those friends they have to let go of. In this one life, keep your family, choose your peers, seriously. The people around you are going to dictate. They've done studies where they said, we take 10 people, you take your 10 best friends and average it out. That's your health, your weight, your income, your everything. If you're around 10 obese people, you're going to start eating cheese fries. And if you're around 10 health nuts, you're going to start eating organic cheese fries. And <laughs> but if you're around 10 millionaires, you'll start to see it's easy to make money. If you're around 10 broke asses, you'll hear why it's impossible, right? So you'll start moving from that way. So I, so I started to worry, and then I got love for it. And then this started getting worse and worse and worse. I would go on stage, and I would think worse thoughts. And I got to a point where I was literally crying before I went on stage, right? And so it got really, really bad. And now I'm going, also, my identity is that I'm a comedian. Do you know what I mean by that? I was the chubby kid in high school, I book a teen movie, I'm on stage a lot, and that's when everybody loves me. So for 10 years, I didn't even feel worthy of talking to people until they knew that I was a stand-up comic. Like, I'd be on a plane with someone and be like, oh yeah, when I had my comedy career, and oh, you're a comic? Now I felt worthy of it. How much do you think that would affect my relationships when eventually we get through the bullshit and eventually she knows the real me and I don't feel worthy of having that girl or anything because like she just knows the comedian. We do that with everything. My income. I'm my income, right? That's why a lot of times people that lose millions of dollars 
will be more suicidal than people that just never had the money because they don't think they're that identity. If you think you are your, 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 your body, you're going to be sad when you lose it. If you think you are, you're not. You're just this moment, the end, right? So I got worse and worse, and then while I was at the height of it, I booked my first Comedy Central appearance with three months' notice, and my manager goes, don't blow it. Right. So what do you think's the first thing I thought? I'm going to faint on the Comedy Central thing, which will ruin my comedy career, right? My one chance to make it, because that's what I believed, this is my one chance. I worked for 15 years at this point, and here I am, and I'm going to faint on Premium Blend on this Comedy Central show. So my mind started literally coming up with all these sabotaging ways and really seeing it, and I thought, if that happens, that'll ruin my life. So this is when I started to get kind of suicidal, and I started really getting close to killing myself and really fantasizing about that. And it got to a point where I literally would wake up in the morning, I would worry all day and picture other people fainting. It was the craziest thing. I would just, every person I saw walking, I'm like, how are they doing that? Like, it was like really weird. And I got to the day where I did Premium Blend and the plane landed in New York. And I remember I had escalated this so much that I would stand on, in the airport and I would be walking through the airport holding on to you know, the stuff here, the suitcase rack, everything. And I was now at a point where I've escalated this to even farther and farther. So I go on stage and I do my premium blend. Damon Wayans introduces me. And I go on stage. And the only thing I'm thinking is, don't faint, don't faint. That's literally all I'm thinking. I'm holding the mic like this. My legs are turned in. And I did an eight-minute set in six minutes because I had flown through the material so fast. I walk off stage, the girl that I'm dating at the time goes, uh, or well, the Comedy Central goes, that was so good, even though inside I was in hell. They go, that was so good, we're gonna give you your own half hour special. The girl I'm dating at the time goes, oh shit. And I go, what? And she goes, now I'm gonna hear you worry about that for the next three months. So the next day after the breakup, what happened, I picked up a Tony Robbins book, and one of the things it said was, you can't think of two things at the same time. My problem with the feigning was, I thought, I can't stop thinking about this. But the truth is, you can't think of two things at the same time if you choose to put your focus on one of them, right? So I realized that my mind was bored and coming up with all this don't faint thing, so I needed to replace the thought with what I do want completely. But my mind wants that challenge so much that I need to make it like what Vision was saying, something completely unrealistic. So I said this, how can I have the number one Comedy Central special? The highest rated Comedy Central special. Now realize at this time, Dane Cook was out, Larry the Cable Guy, all these people had half hour specials. And I'm sitting here saying, how can I have the number one special, right? So literally, the next morning, I did some physiology movements and all the stuff that I learned from different seminars, and I did what I called taking my mind to the gym. I literally started picturing that I had the number one Comedy Central special. I would hold on to it, and I would wake up at six in the morning and dance around the house and be like, you have the number one Comedy Central special, and I would keep thinking that. And while I was holding that, my mind started offering visions of my favorite gigs that I ever had. It goes, remember when you did this show at FSU? You did three and a half hours? And then I started channeling that, and my mind started thinking it was there. And I looked back at the anxiety within 10 minutes, and it was already gone. The anxiety I had for three months, I'd broken it because it was, I realized I had overcome it, right? So then I was like, holy shit, how good can this get? So I kept going, and every hour, I did an hour a day of doing that. It got down to the day of the Comedy Central taping. I get to New York. I feel amazing. There's cameras all over me, two balcony theater, and it's 30 seconds till I'm on stage, and I'm with my manager, and I looked at him, and I go, did I ever tell you about the time that I performed at the Fairhaven Bar in Bellingham? I just felt like channeling a no-pressure gig, because you know that when you think about something, your mind doesn't know the difference between what you're thinking about and what's actually happening, right? So I realized that when I'm in that bar, or I'm just running material in the bathroom, or if I'm on stage at Comedy Central, I'm not physically doing anything different. I'm just deciding my surroundings are different. Do you get what I'm saying? So when you're talking to Obama or your mom, it shouldn't make you any different because it's what you're feeling internally. So. So I started to, uh, can I go a couple more minutes, just finish this? I'm sorry, I know, I know that it's, it's funny because last night I was like, I want it, should I put this shit in here and then leave them with a cliffhanger? So, um, 
so I so I'm backstage with my manager and I go, I want to tell you about the time I performed at the Fairhaven Bar in Bellingham. So I start 30 seconds left and I go, I'm, I go, I tell him, I go, I'm backstage at the bar and they go, Kyle Cease is here from 10 Things I Hate About You. And I told him and I said, I took the crowd and I said, I felt like I took the crowd and I put it in a duffel bag and I flew it around. And while I'm saying that, they're going, five, four, three. From New York City, Comedy Central presents Kyle Cease. And I looked at my manager and I said, I'll tell you the rest in a second. And I went out on stage, and I saw the audience, and I felt the exact same I did in that no pressure bar. And I just started doing my material in the order that I usually do it, even though Comedy Central wanted me to do it with their teleprompter you know, they, we had an agreement with this, and they said, don't do any crowd work. But if you watched me last night, fuck that. So, <laughs> so I'm doing my act on stage the way I do it, and the teleprompter's trying to follow me, right? Eventually, it was just a question mark and a guy going, what the hell? And, <laughs> and so I do my act my way, and I start doing crowd work on Comedy Central on my special. My heart knew to do it, even though it's against the rules completely. I finished the show, Roaring Standing Ovation, the only one of that year, and it was the number one Comedy Central special. It was the highest rated Comedy Central special of 2006. And I'll tell you this one part, and then I'm going to go. But the biggest thing after that was when that happened, I said, holy shit, there's a matrix that I just got out of. How good can this get? So in 2009, this is my last thing I'll tell you. Comedy Central put out their 100 favorite comedians, and they said they wanted the public to vote on them. Now, this list was insane. This list had everyone you can think of that's the greatest, I mean, like huge, huge household name comics. And this was the question I had. How can I win this? Now, what Vishen said earlier about uh, what and why, I completely agree with. I, those two I already had down. I had got those three, and I was like, how can I? Because when you say, how can you, it's a given you can, right? So I said, how can I win the stand-up showdown? How can I get the most votes? And my mind came up with immediately, what if you did a podcast where you thanked everyone who voted for you in the showdown by name? And my mind goes, okay. So I went on MySpace and Facebook, and I said, vote for me in the stand-up showdown. I'll thank you by name, right? The next day, 400 people wrote me. So I did this motivational, inspirational podcast because I wanted a Trojan horse some positivity into these dumb shits. So, um, <laughs> and then at the end, I said, I'd like to thank the following people. And I literally listed 400 names. And people would be like, dude, why are you doing that? Are you crazy? That, that's like 20 minutes. You're right. That could have been a sitcom that I could have watched, almost. Like, or I could make 400 fans for life, right? And every time I sell a CD, there's 400 sold, right? There's the 400 more YouTube hits, all those things, right? So the next day, I said at the end of that, I'm going to do this again tomorrow, and I knew those people's friends would listen. So I thanked the next day, 800 names. And the first day I did it, I went from 18th to 8th place, and there were still two weeks left in the contest. So the next day, I did 800, bam, 7th place, pulled ahead of Dane Cook. The next day, 6th place, 5th place. I was thanking 1,600, 20, literally 2,000, 3,000 names, right? The last week, it's myself and Jeff Dunham. This is the last part. Last week, it's myself and Jeff Dunham. Jeff Dunham had a new Comedy Central special coming out, a new TV show. So Comedy Central wanted him to win. So they pulled my special off in the last week, and they put like 15 Jeff Dunham specials on to get the crowd to vote. And they said, vote for Jeff Dunham in the Comedy Central stand-up showdown at every commercial break. And I thought, wow, that's the first time I've had enough power that I've just changed national television's programming. You get what I'm saying? It's not a problem. It's what we do with it. So I told my fans were worried like crazy, and I said, listen, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. It's what you do with it. It's just a test to see how bad we want it. Everything in your life's a test to see how bad you want it. You want the ultimate relationship, but your friend has tickets to the Playboy Mansion? That's a test to see how bad you want it. <laughs> Anyone else having this problem? So the last week, the last week, Jeff Dunham and I are neck and neck. And the last night, they ran four more Jeff Dunham specials, and the following Sunday is when you find out who's number one. They ran the specials all day on Comedy Central, literally, 2019, 18. And then I got a call from the East Coast that Jeff Dunham was in second place. And I got first place in two weeks with 238,000 votes. And I just say that because I want you to know you are so unbelievably unlimited. You're so unlimited. And if you just say, how can I, after you say the what and the why, I promise you, if you want it, you can have it. It is so fucking easy. Just go get it. It is so simple. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Thank you for letting me go long, too. I can't wait to see Lisa. Thank you.